There are a couple of questions that keep me up at night. How come we're always out of salsa? Who designed the ghost in Paper Mario to have such gigantic hair? Why do four of my last five videos all start with the word how? Has a penguin ever looked at a man in a suit and thought, my god, I, I didn't know they made us that big? And most importantly, I wonder what would happen if I ever played Animal Crossing. Because to be very crystal clear with you, I never have, and I'm terrified to pick up this game for a cascade of reasons. For one, it has an insanely dedicated following of folks that like it, and shouldn't. Like seriously, when I see trailers for this game, I feel like the target audience would be kids due to the charm and cute art style, or older generations. The Farmville demographic, who enjoy quiet things like gardening and decorating and passive aggressive homeowners association disputes. Which to me is a far reach from my demographic, who typically enjoys the more action heavy, in your face, gonna slap you a 20 megatons of adventure per second JRPG FPS MMO GTFO Skyrim on your dishwasher core gamers category on Nintendo.com, leave an angry comment on an IGN review, play Dark Souls blindfolded because fear is just a state of mind and a game that you beat when you were 10 genre. But realistically, this is just me being short-sighted, because I know so many people my age that are ready to dive headfirst into a very wholesome debt with Nook Fargo just to keep up with the Joneses. And because there are so many people like me that do love Animal Crossing, I'm afraid that if I try it, I will also love it and never look back. Now, don't get me wrong, time you enjoyed wasting is not wasted. There are games I've happily picked up as essentially a part-time job, like I'm 200 hours and about 60 PB&Js into Fire Emblem Three Houses right now and still going strong. But the idea of playing Animal Crossing specifically is terrifying to me because I know of a little something called the Maximization Paradox, which I'll explain momentarily. Though I will say, since I've never actually played Animal Crossing before, my concern is based entirely off of what I've seen from random Let's Plays, trailers, and small talk amongst the squad. So, to put my worries to the test and see if Animal Crossing is truly the endless spiral of despair I think it is, I've invited on two of my dearest friends, Jack and Shane, who have been seasoned Animal Crossing aficionados since the days of the Melee Machine to answer my burning questions about how Animal Crossing works, hopefully quell my fears about it, and maybe, just maybe, convince me to give it a try. Or at least get me to stop having tea parties. Let me paint a picture for you. It's a Friday night in summer of 2004. Your dad busts down the door of your room. He's hype, he just got off work. It's the weekend and he says, hey sport, get your Heelys on. We're going to Blockbuster. You can pick three movies. But you're an ungrateful little dick dick and you've got specifics. And you say, but dad, I want a game instead. He says, all right, fine, but games are more expensive to rent, so you gotta pick just one. Filled with the disappointment of your dog when you don't actually throw the ball, you reluctantly agree and run your little entitled ass to the video game section. You start scoping out some games. You might try the new Madden, Prince of Persia is catching your eye, your buddy Ted won't shut up about Knights of the Old Republic. You already have Tony Hawk underground at the house, but the disc is scuffed and you could swap it out with a blockbuster copy. Oh, and they have Paper Mario in stock. They never have that in stock. There's a ton of great options, and before you know it, you're begging your dad to let you pick two or three because it's way too hard to pick just one. Analysis paralysis is real, and we've all felt it, especially in games. Character customization screens, check. Weapon choices in Bastion, check. Skill trees in Salt and Sanctuary, check. Strategies in a chess match, check. Mate. I won't beat a dead horse here because a ton of great channels have already covered analysis paralysis, but essentially, too many options for players can be super overwhelming and may lead to either not making a decision or optimizing the fun out of a game. With a ton of options, we often get bogged down in that choice because we really want to make a solid decision, but the more alternatives, the more taxing a calculation for our sweet little noggins. You may already be familiar with that idea if you've seen this extra credits video, but what you may not know is that how you handle analysis paralysis is greatly affected by the type of person you are. Because there are two types of people in this world, maximizers and satisficers. Yes, satisfice is a real word. When you think maximizer, think the Amy Santiago's, the Jane Villanueva's, the Sheldon Coopers. These folks are so concerned with making the best decision that they exhaustively investigate every option available until they can safely arrive at the optimal course of action. 
I've done all my research, I conducted an informal poll, and I've arrived at the rock solid certainty I've made the right choice. If you're a maximizer who knew ahead of time that you'd be going to Blockbuster, you might spend some of the week making a list of potential picks for when you go in on Friday. Set up some pros and cons of each title, pick some alternatives in case they were out of stock, etc, etc. Satisficers, on the other hand, are the Nick Millers, the Drake Parkers, the Sean Spencers. They're going to see the variety of options and probably pick the first one that satisfies what they're looking for. If it's not the best, that's fine. It'll still get the job done. In his book, The Paradox of Choice, psychologist Barry Schwartz points out that only around 10% of the population is truly a maximizer in every decision that they make. More than likely, most of us are some combination of the two, which is why if you take a maximizer slash satisfizer quiz online to see which you are, you'll probably be somewhere in the middle. You may be a maximizer when it comes to decisions that are important to you, like what you want to major in, but a satisficer when deciding on a brand of toilet paper. Or, you know, maybe it's the other way around for you. I, I get it. You gotta, gotta, gotta preserve your tush. But if there is a decision that you'd process with your quote-unquote maximizer orientation, it is possible that you will fall victim to the maximization paradox. The term maximization paradox was coined in a 2009 study where a group of psychologists found that because maximizers are motivated to make the absolute best choice possible, they'd be much more willing to spend resources, be it time or money, to have access to a larger array of options than satisficers. In their study, maximizers would consistently drive further, spending extra time and gas for more ice cream flavor options or even basic cleaning supply options. They'd even fill out extra paperwork to have a larger chocolate assortment to choose from. The maximizer rationale for this seemed to be that more options would provide a better decision and therefore a happier outcome. Of course, the cruel truth from this study is that the maximizers who sacrificed to attain more options were ultimately less satisfied with their choice when compared to satisficers, and even other maximizers who simply went with the smaller selection. For maximizers, it's pretty clear that in reality, more choice equals rut row raggy and less choice equals rooby dooby doo. Did I seriously write this? Did I seriously write that? However, what I find disturbing is this illusion that more choices will make you happier, despite real evidence to the contrary. And this is what has me in a cold sweat to take out a mortgage with Raccoon Uncle Pennybags and his kids. Because Animal Crossing buries you in options. Now, I hear what you're saying. Daryl, a ton of games give you loads of options, and I've never heard you gripe about this before. Games like Red Dead, Horizon, Zelda, and The Witcher have hundreds of hours of content to be discovered, but it's not a problem. Name me a solid RPG or roguelike that doesn't give you a lot of strategic and aesthetic personalization. And you're right, typically this is fine. But you see, the key difference with these games is that most options are a means to an end, at least in my eyes. You do the side quests in The Witcher to get more crowns or crafting opponents to progress towards beating the game. You take down the shrines in Breath of the Wild to get stronger, which gets you into more hostile areas and eventually into Hyrule Castle. And sure, there may be other reasons you do anything in these games, but your true ultimate goal is to eventually be good enough to go and beat the game. Even if you're a true maximizer and decide to 100% horizon for every weapon and side quest, at some point you will hit that limit and can no longer reveal more options. Animal Crossing, however, doesn't exactly end from what I'm told. Plus all of the clothes, accessories, house designs, personalization, crafting possibilities, and apparently landscaping doesn't progress you to some final goal or finish line defined by the game. There seems to be no massive utility in an adorable new sweater. Most of these options are simply a matter of taste. And this is scary to me because I am a maximizer when it comes to taste. Not so much utility. Seriously, just ask my wife. We go shopping for a new vacuum, for example. I'm not picky. She can't even get me to give a good opinion. And then this one is specifically made to clean up pet hair. And they're all within $30 of each other. Like, we just, I don't know. We need all of them, I guess. What do you think? As long as it sucks, I don't really care. But if we go clothes shopping for me? Well, we don't, because I just want to check every store and every website for just the right sweatpants. And as the study suggests, I'm never truly satisfied with what I get. Same thing goes for restaurant menus, unless I'm starving. And the same goes for games. 
I'm not going to overthink my weapons or materials in a game because I'm not a maximizer for that. It's really just a means to an end for me. I won't spend too much time on my build and fire emblem because really I'm just trying to make the squad good enough to progress the story and make the game fun. I refuse to optimize the enjoyment out of it. Unless Ingrid dies, in which case it's Resteady Spaghetti. But I feel like if I picked up Animal Crossing, I'd be consistently trying to unlock new stuff before I committed to spending money on anything. I'd spend so much time trying to access more customization options under the illusion that more options will make my final decisions the best ones, despite the fact that no matter what I pick, I'll ultimately be disappointed that I missed out on another choice. Or I'll reveal so many options that it'll be like Blockbuster all over again. Do I want the blue hats or the red one? I don't want to spend money on both if I only use one. Oh. <laughs> Meanwhile, I will have spent a crazy amount of time getting to this point and not feel like it's been well spent. And since the game never ends or defines a win, I'll just keep repeating the process, not really feeling satisfied and oh my god, just hate me vacuum shopping. Alright, I can feel your anger in the comment section already. It's time to get the boys on the line and put my fears to the test. Will Animal Crossing actually send me into a maddening spiral of despair and disappointment, or is it designed to keep that from happening? One of the first things I asked Jack and Shane about was how committed I have to be to items and materials I buy in-game, and how many there are available. If there are too many options up front and I have to pick just a handful, those maximizer tendencies are going to kick in and I'll start holding out for more variety later on. The cool thing they did in the last game, which I think they're bringing back, is once you buy it, it's cataloged to like the shopping kiosk. So if you're like, no, I don't like it, I want to sell it now, you can always go back into the kiosk and rebuy rather than having to wait for it to come back. Oh, okay. So if you get rid of it, it'll always stay available. I will say this, there are specific items that you can't just purchase again. They're like special limited time items. Okay. Mostly from seasonal events and just special events and stuff like that. Those are more limited time things. So the game... Yes, which... Um, I'm sorry, um, not to cut you off. Which yeah. they did confirm in the next... The most recent direct that they are going to be seasonal events, which if anything like Pocket Camp, the mobile game they did, mm -hmm. those were limited. You had to get it then or you missed out. Like okay. the Halloween event, you had to get during that or you missed it. Okay. So the game just really truly rewards you for like playing it at all times. Yep. Oh yeah. And okay. I mean, <laughs> so the ability to sell and archive items is nice because it keeps me from having to pick just one thing. I can buy it, try it out, and then sell it back if I change my mind on it without losing it forever. And the shops limiting the items available every day really makes it tough for me to hold out and maximize my options, because unless I act now, who knows when I'll see it again. I think they're even going to double down on this in New Horizons with these merchants that will drop by occasionally and sell special items you can't find elsewhere. Placing limits or forcing the player to make a decision without all of the info is a great way to persuade folks to just play. Fire Emblem and Into the Breach, for example, will tell you how your opponent will move next turn, but no further. Dead Cells forces you to spend the cells you earn on new power-ups before you can move on to the next biome, so holding out for more options ain't happening. Another great way games can keep you moving along is by rewarding your decision to make a decision. From the Direct, it looks like there's this mileage program that will reward you for basic actions and purchases throughout the game. And in previous Animal Crossings, apparently this was done in the form of shops rewarding you for buying their items and investing in them. I'm not exactly sure how this is going to work with New Horizons, but New Leaf, as far as store upgrades and stuff like that go, you would have to spend like a certain amount of money and wait a certain amount of time as well. Like, I think I remember for one of the, just the main general store upgrades, you had to wait about three weeks and spend, I want to say, maybe 100,000 bells if I remember right. It literally, if you had that three weeks and you haven't spent the money yet, as soon as you did, the next day it would upgrade, but if you hit the money limit, you were waiting then. So when you say hit the money limit, like you, you spend a certain amount of money and then like the shop upgrades? Yeah, because I mean you're okay. essentially investing in the store by buying okay. stuff from them. Okay, gotcha. Hearing this made me feel so much better, because suddenly renting a game now means more games will be available next time. Purchasing items has a dual purpose. One is that you increase your selection for later, which maximizes your options, and two, it gets you an item now without you having to make an overly tough decision. It breaks the paradox because you don't have to pick just one. 
Just like stage components in Mario Maker, you're encouraged to explore all the nuggets the game has to offer and rewarded by all the new possibilities. Picking just one or two things would be a disservice to what the game wants to do. Of course, realistically, there will be a bit of grinding to make sure that I can get all the clothes and furniture I want, but apparently, between the music and the ambience, even grinding in these games is super relaxing, therapeutic, and satisfying. Honestly, it's a really chill game. It helps calm me down, and just the customization of it is so much fun. You really get to make this town your own. And the end results are honestly really cool to see from back when you first started. Mm. Yeah, I bet it is a journey. Like, you look up one day and you just have a bunch of stuff. Why am I selling the game? I already kind of want it. Why, <laughs> why even ask that? My friends, I'll conclude by answering some questions. Were Jack and Shane able to quell my fears about Animal Crossing? Yes. The entire series does offer a ton of options and customization, and you can certainly maximize these options obsessively, but the game rewards you for doing so along the way. You get more ice cream options by buying ice cream, and this removes the feeling of missing out that drives the maximization paradox. Do I think Animal Crossing is just for other demographics? Absolutely not. It's clear that this is a tremendously wholesome experience that does a lot of good for a lot of people. Dude, even the soundtrack makes me feel cherished and all warm and snuggly. This song sounds like a hug. Animal Crossing is certainly something I could see myself enjoying, and I've got to say, all my fears have melted away. Do you hear me? I'm not afraid anymore! So, will I be buying New Horizons? <laughs> no, I'm still playing Fire Emblem.